I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this is Outside My Window. Alzheimer's disease is a chronic neurodegenerative disease that destroys brain cells, causing thinking ability and memory to deteriorate over time. Some might use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably. However, Alzheimer's is a specific disease, while dementia is a general term for a group of similar diseases, of which Alzheimer's is only one of many. Alzheimer's disease is not a normal part of aging and is irreversible. While Alzheimer's has always been with us, attempts to understand and identify the disease and its impact didn't really come about until very recently in human history. Since 1983, the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia has been here to support Nova Scotians on their dementia journeys. They've come a long way in the past 40 years, They've grown from a small group of volunteers who wanted to make a difference in the lives of people living with dementia to an organization of over 30 staff supporting thousands of clients, their care partners, and the health care professionals who care for them. Recently, the ASNS held an information session at Mariners on Main, where they held an open discussion about the future of dementia support in our area. Quinn Taggart had an opportunity to sit on in this discussion and was able to chat with staff member Sandra Hubbard LeBlanc. Now, she's the regional coordinator of education and outreach for the Tri-Counties. Sandra, the last time we talked to you, you were with the VON and we were in the middle of a pandemic and we were talking about all kinds of things to kind of keep that moving. You've since moved on to the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. What are you doing for them? Oh, I'm uh, still doing similar work. I'm a regional coordinator for Yarmouth, Shelburne and Digby County. So I work with programming, of course, and supports. I do outreach and education, public education. But uh, for direct support for client to uh, Alzheimer's Society, that really goes through our info line. Doesn't mean that people can't call me, though, and uh, discuss issues, and I can then liaise them to whoever they need to speak to you got a pretty big territory to handle. <laughs> a little bit. It can certainly pack up the kilometers pretty quickly. Uh, I'm very fond of the Tri-Counties. Right now, a lot of my work is focused in Yarmouth. Uh, that's just because this is where I'm comfortable. This is where I have the most networks and community partners. But my goal is to get out into Digby and Shelburne. So if anybody is listening to this, please do contact me because I really do want to do some caregiver support groups and some education and uh, all kinds of things in your area and get to network and get to know what the needs are in those areas as well because I want to support the tri-counties. If somebody is listening and they're finding themselves in a situation where one of their family members has been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's in general, it's not just daunting for the individual being diagnosed. It's got to be daunting for the rest of the family. What recommendation would you have for them as a first step to making sure that they're on the right path? Oh, great question. So the first thing is to connect with the Alzheimer Society, whether it's contacting me directly or calling our info line. And info line uh, really is bigger than what the word says. It is a support line. It is a helpline. It is a what do I do next line where we can then draw out kind of a map to say, okay, if you're at this point in the journey, then maybe you need these types of supports to help you or uh, your person with dementia, because we support both. But you're right, dementia is a two-person or a family disease. That's what it's known as, because as things progress, of course, there's more uh, supports that are required from whether it's a spouse or a daughter or a son or an uncle or a sister, you know, whatever. So we're here for everybody. Reach out to the society. We are the first link for sure. And you can self-refer, you know, and even if you have a neighbor that you think maybe, you know, you're seeing some some different things happening. Maybe the neighbor is wandering or seeming lost. You know, Just call InfoLine and say, this is what's happening, and then we can support that person to maybe then support them. Do you think that maybe over the course of time, people would benefit from you know some additional education? People will think, oh, you're forgetting things, just getting old. 
Ah, love that question. Absolutely. Dementia is not just a meant for getting things. It's, uh, you know, it's very in-depth. So education is number one on our list. You're, you're less afraid of what you know. So reaching out and getting uh, maybe some public education out in the area, just learning yourself, we, can, we have so many resources we can send out if people just want to read about it, find out what is dementia, what is Alzheimer's, what's the difference, what does this mean, what's happening, why can't they speak to me anymore or seem lost when I'm speaking with them. Uh, reach out and we can help with those things. And it really is education is the key to get... Uh, whatever supports and help that will help the situation. Because you can live well with dementia. You really can. If you're living with it yourself or if you're supporting a person with dementia, there is help. And the more help you have, the more successful you are and happier you are at living with this. People say, well, you know, kids don't come with manuals. <laughs> uh, it, but ne but neither do dementia patients. And so every situation is going to be different. Every person's going to react different. Uh, emotions are going to run high. But there's got to be some commonalities that are going to be helpful for people. There are, for sure. But one person with dementia is one person with dementia. So what may work for one person will be totally the opposite for another. So that's where caregiver support groups come into, you know, a, a good place to be because you get connections, uh, you share stories, you share the laughter, you share the tears, all of that. So you're right, there is no manual, but there are supports. There's lots of information. There's lots of websites with resources. UK is really uh, well set up in their dementia care, as is Australia. Canada as well, uh, Alzheimer's Society of Canada, their website, and then there's us, Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. Um, so, yeah, you're right. There are no manuals, but there's all kinds of info. So today we're at Mariners on Main for a bit of a quote-unquote town hall kind of scenario with your CEO and one of your board members. Maybe talk a little bit about what was presented today. Oh, I'm so glad. It's, you know, I've heard so many times from being in a rural part of Nova Scotia is, um, you know, the city is different, and the city is different. I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. Uh, we are centrally focused as far as the office in Halifax has the most staff. But we do have region, regional coordinators in every corner of the province right now. So when John and Carrie reached out and said, you know, we'd like to come down, and I just, I melted. I was so happy to think, okay, good, we're finally spreading out. And it just goes to show that the Alzheimer's Society, while, they're, while we're heavy in Halifax, they're not just focused on Halifax and HRM. They are well focused on outside regions and the rural the differences that we live in the medical system, in whatever system, social supports, whatever. So while they're living in Halifax, their focus is province-wide. So the town hall today just came and expressed a lot of, you know, who we are, what we do, how we're funded, which is government funded, but mostly, you know, pretty well 50% of our funding is fundraised money which makes us be able to focus on more specific programs in specific areas. So um, thrilled that John and Carrie were here and uh, the community partners surrounded us around the table and we're hoping to get some champions to help us work in the area and get, get the message out that we're here, we hear you, please reach out to us. We can't see you unless you reach out to us in many cases, so just thrilled that they're here. And if somebody does want to reach out to you, how best for them to do that? They can go to the Alzheimer's Society website, uh, asns.ca. Um, but to reach me, uh, it's sandra.hubbard-leblanc at asns.ca. And uh, once they reach me that way, um, I'm happy to connect. Carrie Cody has been a volunteer member of the board of directors of the ASNS since 2019, and she tells us how she came to be involved with the association. Carrie, you've been a board member since 2019, but 
your background has has kind of brought you here. So maybe just give us a little bit of uh, an understanding of where you've been to kind of get you where you are today. Well, I have a bit of a diverse background. I spent uh, the first 15, 16 years in banking. And uh, then I, I did a few things in between, and then I owned my own business for about 15 years. Uh, two locations, uh, the bulk barn in Bedford and Truro, and so that kept me really busy. And then the pandemic hit, as I think, I think almost every sentence ends with that caveat now, it seems, these days. But uh, I decided to switch gears. What prompted you to switch gears? Was it was it COVID directly and it just sort of the bottom fell out of it or did you kind of take all the fun out of it for you? What really kind of drew you there? I loved my job. I think the Bulk Barn is such a unique company and offering. People love to shop in the store. Uh, but yes, the fun disappeared when COVID happened. Uh, it became very difficult to find employees to work in the store. Uh, to stay working, um, and we lost business. So, of course, we were working harder than ever. Uh, I mean, when COVID first hit, I had to lay off almost all of my employees. I kept about three in addition to myself, and we worked very hard. Uh, we never closed. Uh, we allowed people to come to the front. We would take their order, and then we would run around the store to fulfill their order and let them check out. So, uh, I think I was proud of the fact that we were able to stay open, but we were working harder than we ever had. Much, you know, so much, uh, so many additional cleaning procedures and things like that. So, uh, yeah, so working harder and really not making anything. And uh, so, and I got a little bit burnt out, to be honest. Yeah. So what drew you to the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia? Is, is it personal for you? Absolutely, it's personal. Um I have a grandfather who had Alzheimer's, uh, but closer to me because he lived in Ontario and so we didn't see each other that often. Uh, I have a very good friend in my community who um, saw her mother from the beginning stages to diagnosis through to the end of her life. She uh, was an only child and so she was alone in that journey, very overwhelmed. I mean, she had friends, and certainly we did what we could to support her, but, um, you know, when you're there 24-7, you, you know, once the disease progresses to a certain point, it's very difficult to even leave your home and leave your loved one home alone. So uh, it was very overwhelming for her. I think about her all the time when we are discussing things at board level and how that impacted both of their lives. What have you drawn from that experience that you think makes your position on the board better? I just think being informed about exactly what people are experiencing, uh, you know, and as John said in the presentation today, uh, caregivers are very important as we heard from the information in the landmark study and the information that we know just through the society and interacting with people I think he said 80% of the people that call in for support uh, to the Alzheimer's Society are caregivers of folks with dementia from that standpoint when you when you think of your own personal experience what would you wish comes out of your tenure on the board um, that will help others going forward? I think our goal would be, my goal would be to work as hard as I can to progress uh, getting information out, helping people better with Alzheimer's across the province and across the entire province. In all these small communities, I think it's so important that we get out into the community. Uh, the last couple of days for me has been so valuable uh, and I will definitely be sharing the experiences that I've had uh, with the board and also I'm going to be advocating for a board member to come out with John again, not me, somebody else, so that we, you know, I just think it's so important to get down into the grassroots and see what's happening, hear the conversations around the table today and then using that information to inform decisions we make in the future. When you're sitting around the table and you're trying to figure out, all right, where do we go next? What do we focus on next? I, I, there must be a really long list of items that are going to require some attention. So do you try to just knock one or two off or do you really try to get four or five of them on the go and hope that you can get them there to the end? 
I think we're all always progressing um, the ideas and you know the information that John brings to us as a board, and we prioritize based on what's you know most important at the time. Uh, so I think John will often help inform sort of uh, the priorities, and then we respond accordingly. Some of the uh pivots that you've had to do due to COVID, some of the online learning you've, you've uh, digitized uh, in, on your YouTube channel, some of your training and, and uh, course material. How much of that are you going to keep as a structure moving forward uh, now that, hey, we can meet in person, we can do things in person, but how much of that online stuff do you think has worked? All of it. Uh, we're certainly accessing more people than we ever have before I think because of the availability of online and also I think that online resource is key. I remember my good friend Sheila uh, was so overwhelmed that you know she may not be able to call the Alzheimer's Society between 8 30 and 5 or whatever the operating hours were at the time uh, but she could pick up an online course she couldn't then but she can now pick up an online course that two or three in the morning if that's the time that is best for her. So absolutely, I believe that we will be keeping all of the online resources and enhancing the resources. And it's interesting too, um, as an employee of uh, the society, all of the meetings are recorded. So if folks are out, it's there, it's upon them to go back and listen to the meetings and watch the meetings. So, you know, it's just a really good way to keep continuity of the information to everybody. A lot of organizations rely heavily on volunteers. So I'll give you an opportunity to kind of shout out and thank your volunteers. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, without volunteers, uh, it would be a much different journey, that's for sure. Uh, I'm sure you've mentioned, but all of the board members are volunteers. We're happy to do so. We're passionate about what we do. Like I said, we all have, we all have a personal cause and reason for being there at the table for this organization. And, uh, and, you know, as a volunteer, you always get back more than you give, you know? And so, um, yeah, to encourage someone to volunteer, that's really, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, we all care about the people that we live around. And so... If somebody was interested in volunteering, what's the best way for them to reach out? Contact the Alzheimer's Society. We have a person on staff who is responsible for coordinating our, coordinating our team of volunteers. We have a number of volunteers and Marilyn is an incredible resource and she has them, she has, she is keeping them busy doing all kinds of different things. And I don't, like I said, I don't think the quality of the programs and services and all of the work that we do would be at the same level if it weren't for the volunteers. So thank you volunteers very much. One of your major fundraisers is your walk, the IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's. Um, it's coming up on Sunday, May the 28th, locally. Uh, starts out at uh, Maple Grove Education Center. 1,300 to 1,500, check in at 1,300. Walk begins at 1,400. Is this a 2K, 5K, 10K? It's a 5K walk at your own pace. And so, you know, in prior years, you probably have done some virtual components of that. Is that still an option? Yes, we would encourage anybody if they're not close to a walk location, as we have six across the province, but we know that's not in every community. Absolutely, we would love to see people um, involved in their own communities doing their own thing. They can, you can have a lot of fun and create team names and have even fun costumes. You don't have to be in one of the six places in the province. You can certainly do it anywhere. And how does somebody register? You can register online at www.walknss.ca, and we would love to have your support. The first thing you'll note about current CEO John Britton is the accent. He's not from around here, yet has made great use of his varied background to support the ASNS initiatives. Give us a little sense about how your journey has been 
to get you where you are today? So in terms of my personal journey, my career journey, so uh, that's a long story. I'll try and keep it quite short for you. So uh, as you can tell from the accent, I'm actually from the UK. I moved to Canada in 2005 to Vancouver. And at the time, I was working in corporate uh, in insurance. So when I moved to Canada, I married a Canadian um, I, my residency was taking 14 months and I couldn't work, so I started to volunteer for a charity in Vancouver. And it was almost like all the lights came on. It's like, where was this set to be my entire life? I really found my groove. Um, so I actually took a job with that charity and that was 14 years ago. So when I moved to Nova Scotia in 2010, um, I deliberately was seeking out charitable work and uh, I found my first job with the Heart Center. And uh, I was thrilled to join the Alzheimer's Society in 2019. Uh, so that's a very potted history, but uh, former corporate professional who kind of drifted into the charity sector by accident, but actually found, found my forever home. So what did you draw on from your own personal history that, that really helps you shine in your current role? Uh, well, I love people. I, I'm a real people person, and I get a lot of energy from being around other people, interacting with other people. So as you can imagine, the pandemic was a nightmare for people like myself and for many people uh, because that connection uh, wasn't there. So being, uh, being here today in a room full of like-minded individuals, this gives me all the energy I need uh, to do the work that I do. From a dementia perspective, um, my grandma uh, passed away from dementia and I was, I was a child, I was only six or seven years old, and this was in the late 1980s in northern England, so a whole other continent, four decades ago, and if I took away my grandma's name and the country and told you all of the horrors that we experienced with lack of access to care, etc., etc., that story could be told today in Nova Scotia and that's when I realized that we've got such great work to do because nothing really has shifted in 40 years and that's just not good enough. Obviously there, there's a long laundry list of things that need to be changed, need to be done, need to be uh, augmented and enhanced and so on. How do you prioritize such a list? Oh, that's the million dollar question. Um, we've had a lot of conversations here today about this and I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed when you see the scope and scale of the problem because we're here to talk about dementia. But we're really talking about a whole host of concurrent issues. You can't talk about dementia without also talking about physical health, mental health, poverty, employment status. They're all interlinked. Um, so it's really, really important that we look at this from a all very, very, uh, very, very different angles. So the first thing we do with a list that's so big and with something that's so potentially overwhelming, um, there's a long journey ahead of us. This is why we're here today. The first step is to get buy-in from individuals it takes a village it's a cliche but it's true and we can't do this on our own so our intention today is to beat the drum loud enough that folks link arms with us join this community of practice and then together we'll start to prioritize where do we go first but we can't do any of this work without a cohort of, of interested and invested individuals so that's priority one when we look at the funding formula for Alzheimer's Nova Scotia, uh, you, you had had a slide up that it was about a 56-44 kind of, kind of split. Is that optimal for you? Is that uh, similar or typical to other organizations in the same vein as yourselves? It's very uh, individualized to the organization. There are no hard and fast rules. You could easily say, well, we want 100% of our funding to come from a stable source like the government. The problem with that is that governments change every four years, priorities change, healthcare priorities change. We are very fortunate that our provincial government in all of its iterations has been very, very supportive of dementia um, uh, in, in this province. But uh, just making sure that we are aligning with the right people and having the right conversations at the right time is, is the most important thing. You also mentioned, of course, that you know, a sizable portion of your funding does come from fundraising. So. What did COVID do to you? It must have really kicked you in the shorts. It was horrendous. Uh, I know that many people listening will be nodding along in agreement here. So the real challenge with COVID was on one side of the fence, we were hemorrhaging cash because all of our fundraising initiatives are in person. So we lost our walk and we lost our gala event and folks were worried about their own financial situation because nobody knew where the pandemic was going to go. So the ability to give was reduced. So we were really losing a lot of money on one side, 
but we were also accumulating funding on the other side because we cancelled a lot of in-person programs. So it was a really challenging situation um, to be in. But it's really important that we maintain our fundraising because uh, the government funding is good. 56% of our budget comes from our government partners. The 44% is a lot more fluid. We have a lot more autonomy over where those dollars go and we tend to lean into private funding and donations to do more innovation and innovative work, uh, test proof of concept and that kind of thing. The landmark study, you mentioned that it was the, the first time that we, we had some numbers in like 12 years. Why did it take 12 years? It literally, there's just not really any focus on it. You know, it's uh, those kind of reports take years and years and years anyway, but 12 years of absence of data for an issue that is the number one healthcare problem of our time is really quite shocking and surprising. So there's many, many reasons why it took so long. We're actually more focused on we've got it now. Thankfully, we've got it now. What do we do with this information uh, now, that we, now that we have it? So some of the predictions from that data bring us into a, an 87% uptick in uh, dementia-related cases between now and, say, 2050. But with that in mind, you know, is, are dementia cases rising in, in more of a linear fashion, or is it more exponential, or is it just, hey, we've gotten better at diagnosing it, so now we're seeing this uptick? There is such a lack of cohesive information that it's impossible to answer that question. And it's going to be an obvious answer, but I would say it's a combination of all of the above. You know, definitely there are impacts for uh, risk reduction, but we're not measuring that. And this is why if we're going to do more risk reduction activity with the general population, we need metrics to say, how do we know this is working? How do we know that this message is landing? So we do a lot of public education, but up until this point, we've not really tracked tracked its impact, so we're going to have to start doing that. A lot of the risk factors that you had in one, in one of your slides relate to a wide variety of other health-related issues, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, and the like. Uh, how do you know or how have you postulated that these factors relate specifically to dementia-related activity? We just we just know that all of the things, it's literally that message of move your body more and eat better food. Uh, if you only take those two pieces of advice, use them because they will help you combat a whole host of health problems. As they relate specifically to dementia, uh, it's just how our audio and visual senses relate to our brain function. So you'll see that hearing loss, for example, uh, is one of the risk factors because if you lose your hearing and you don't get hearing aids you're actually reducing the pathways into your brain which can then cause down the line can cause cognitive decline you add that into smoking you add it into hypertension which is all related to your cardiovascular system it's all related to keeping your gray matter uh, in tip-top and optimal condition we know that uh, it's the brain that, and the decay of the brain that causes dementia so all of the risk factor modifications are literally ways to keep your brain healthy are we in a position to be able to connect the dots on genetics as well? Are there genetic factors that will relate into whether or not I'm predisposed for dementia? Yeah, there are, but they're not conclusive by any stretch. And we tend to lean away from that dialogue simply because we don't want people sitting there thinking, wow, my grandma had dementia, now my dad just got dementia, that means I'm going to get dementia. We don't want to put that message into people's minds because uh, it may happen, it may not happen. There's no direct line uh, between those two things. So it can be a factor, but there are many, many factors. The simple fact is we don't still know fully what causes dementia. We just don't. So in the way of preventative measures, other than get out, get moving, healthy lifestyle are there anything else that we should be looking towards uh, really i mean there's 12 determinants of health and there's 12 risk factors that are modifiable and those risk factors come into play more at certain stages of life but it really is that uh uh, that same thing and, and as well as keeping your brain healthy the number one thing that people can do is to stay engaged stay socially active do crossword puzzles, read different puzzle books, you know, watch quiz shows, make sure that you're connecting socially several times a day. It's those kind of connections that will keep you vibrant and keep you well. When we were looking at the statistics, there were, it seemed to be a little bit more of a slant towards women when it came to dementia than, than men. But is there a racial split as well? 
Oh, absolutely, there's a racial split. So we know that, that in African Nova Scotian communities, for example, prevalence of dementia is higher, much, much higher. We don't know exactly why that is, but a lot of social determinants of health come into play there. Underserviced communities that are seeking health equity, for example, lack of access to a physician. This is where things like uh, economic situations come into play and, and, and can show decline in cognitive function as well. So there's definitely, uh, definitely more uh, different ethnicities that are uh, more prone to dementia for sure. And you've got a really good web website with a lot of great information. How best is it for people to be able to reach out and contact you? So the, the website's a great place to start. There is a wealth of uh, resource on there, lots of referral information. All of our support materials are PDF. You can download them directly from the website. During the pandemic, we started to record all of our education sessions. So if you go to our YouTube channel, there is a huge amount of education uh, widely available on that channel. And then, of course, the other thing to do is call us. We have a, an excellent team. We have an info line service that's open to anybody. You don't need to be referred by a physician. It could be that you're worried about yourself. It could be that... You know, you have a relative that may be showing some signs and you don't know what to do. The, the key is just stay connected and pick up the phone and call us. If you or someone you know may be showing early symptoms of dementia, you can go to their website at asns.ca and reach out for guidance and support. There are folks in your area that can help and you do not have to navigate this alone. I'm Gary Nickerson. And I'm Quinn Taggart. And this has been Outside My Window.